Art Slice is a different dive into art history. We goof around, we curse, you learn from it, but don't expect a typical lecture. You're welcome. Evolution is purposeful, it's not random. And Hilma's passion about life's evolution shows through in her paintings for the temple. She was instructed by the high masters to keep them secret, but Hilma thought she knew of someone who was worth breaking the promise for. There was someone who would surely understand her vision and could maybe even teach her more about the phenomena that had inspired these works. But could she convince this busy man to travel all the way up to Stockholm, Sweden, from Berlin, Germany, to come and look at a stranger? secret paintings. You would think no, but actually, he agrees. Hilma is standing at the edge of her studio, back to the windows, her eyes following Rudolf Steiner, prominent spiritual teacher and clairvoyant from the Theosophical Society, who walked back and forth from painting to painting, They both wore black from head to toe, a stark contrast to the bright and colorful paintings that filled the studio from floor to ceiling. Rudolph's eyes had widened as he scanned the room, his face hard to read as it rested in his hand. Hilma had forgotten how tired she was and nervously dropped her pencil. The sound broke the silence. The sun lit Rudolph's face as he turned to speak. Okay, let's talk about this studio visit, um, this awkward welcome ass Welcome to studio Art Slice, visit. a palatable serving of art history. I'm Stephanie Duane, oh. yes. <laughs> Right. Um, welcome to Art Slice, a podcastable serving of art history. I am who he said I was. He is L.S. Ru- Russell Shoemaker. <laughs> Let's cut to the chase listeners. Today, we will pick up where we left off all the way back in episode 14. Still, still less than a year ago. We made it. It's know, under, under a year. Okay. Under a year. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're back to discuss <laughs> the densely layered painting Group 9, also known as The Swan. From 1914 to 1915, 24 oil paintings on canvas by Our Lady of Purpose, Hilma of Clint. Mm. It's so densely layered, in fact, Russell, mm. I knew, I knew we couldn't have pantry mods interrupting us. <laughs> so, come here, look, look, look over here. What is that? Oh, God. Are they watching Ways of Seeing? Oh my God. They fucking love John Berger. They fucking love John Berger. They love his hair. <laughs> I mean, they, I mean Shh. Got, they got, back then, he kind of had the pantry mon. Yeah. Kind of like a furry potato. Look, look, look. That is why Manet's painting, which really marks the end of the period I'm considering, is so profound a comment on all the work. Okay. Okay. As we alluded to in our first dive into Hilma's life, her story is often cropped to fit a cleaner Mm. art history brain, AHB friendly (laughs) narrative. And Hilma does not fit cleanly into categories because Stephanie, she's kind of a black swan. (laughs) A little bit. And listeners, I have to admit against my best intentions, I too believed the AHB friendly narrative. Mm, Yes. I know, gasp. I saw the Hilma work. Mm. I read the Hilma books. I was ready to wrap it all up, wrap this show up. Then my partner, apple of my eye over there, Russell, he just, he just kept pulling at these threads. He's unleashing the curse that has haunted us since July 2021. Sorry, Stephanie, but I did make us these neat, I survived Hilma off Clint the Swan 2022, (laughs) and all I got was this t-shirt t-shirt. So, you know, expect it in the mail soon. Yes, I... Oh, you said you're sending it to us. Okay, so I needed to be reminded that we survived. Yes, for now, thank you. For now, we right. survived for now. Okay. There's still more. Yeah. Jesus. Well, anyway, the swan is meant to be read like a book or walked through like a mural. Revisiting it will only reward you with mm-hmm. new moments, mm-hmm. new surprises, and God boy, mm-hmm. golly gee, did we find Jesus. some new surprises. <laughs> 
So let's just get into it, Stephanie. As a reminder, we're going to ask you once again to get on Hilma's level, suspend your disbelief or belief in theosophy, anthroposophy, Rosicrucian philosophy, <laughs> Kobala philosophy, oh, and no. put on that God bod. Zip it up tight. Get ready. Yeah, just okay. get ready. Okay, yes, get ready. <laughs> we're going to cover a lot. Grab some coffee. Mothertongue.coffee, offer code uh, Earthlicepod. And let's... word I check out. 15% <laughs> off. Limited time. And let's take a deep dive into those wild Hilma waters. Back to that awkward ass studio visit. Listeners, we're just going to go ahead and say it that nobody really knows what happened. We can only put the pieces together from Hilma's journals. And it's actually rare that we have anything personal left of hers as far as writing. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of pages of her notes where she writes about her work, but she pretty much destroyed all of her personal notes and correspondence. So I'm just going to present this as a thought experiment, Stephanie. Okay, Okay. just a thought experiment. And you need not confirm nor deny this. I want to float this out here to you. You. Okay. All right. You ready? I'm about to lift it into the air. You ready? Okay. Okay. See it floating over to you. Booty call. What? Booty call. No. I'm just saying he gets all no. these letters from an artsy babe in Stockholm, Sweden. He's lonely. Okay. All right. She's lonely. He's a bookish <laughs> weird fellow. Okay. No. And he maybe starts to just clear his calendar a little bit. He starts looking for lectures in the uh, Nordic region. Anyway, no. Um. So this is an event that is almost always brought up when discussing Hilma's life, mm. the studio visit, not the other stuff he said. I think people really like the drama, if I'm being honest. We know for sure she invited him for a studio visit, and he went all the way from mainland Mm -hmm. Europe to Stockholm. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Still floating in the ether. This was a booty call. There's a little booty ghost floating around in our studio. Trains and ferries, Stephanie. Multiple countries, bodies of water. I think that's a 20th (gasps) century booty call. Oh, my God. I think that's what Rudolph thought. (laughs) I'm not saying that's what Hilma won. Maybe she did. Hey, I'm not judging. This is why this is why she destroyed the correspondence. I bet they're a bunch of like titillating letters between her and Rudolph. Oh my There's god. There's like drawings of Rudolph naked with like a little cat tail. <laughs> what the hell is that was to stop? Listeners, I just want you to know that it's hard for me sometimes to agree with Russell, yeah. especially on uh and, and, and listeners, <laughs> also don't put this in your paper. This is this is no. in our brains. <laughs> All right. If you remember, listeners, Hilma was instructed to be hush-hush about the paintings for the temple, Mm. but she opened up, allowed herself to be vulnerable to receive some guidance from Rudolf Steiner. Young leader, possibly a bachelor, didn't check, in the European (laughs) Theosophical Societies, and he was head of metaphysical teaching. So this is someone Hilma could potentially really trust, who would really understand what she was making, probably, hopefully. Let's think about what Hilma has accomplished up until this point in her life. She is an independent and talented artist. Duh. Duh. She has started her own esoteric group in Defem. She is confident in her abilities as a medium for the High Masters, her spiritual teachers. Mm. She's undertaken the mission of a lifetime, which ended the Fem, in creating <laughs> half of a massive body of work in just over a year. But even great artists, great mediums need some feedback. They need some guidance. And she can't put it on her resume, Stephanie, because she has to keep it a secret. <laughs> Damn, right. Yeah, just like us with Art Slice. <laughs> So this really means a lot to her is what what you're trying to say. So she's going to take a chance and she's going to allow a stranger to have a look-see. And to me, it sounds like he was totally taken aback by her work. Mm. Okay, like Senor Rudolfo is what I'm calling him now. Like he (laughs) needed to study himself. Well, Stephanie, he left his clairvoyant shoes at home. (laughs) Why? Because he he brought the nice ones because of the booty call. (laughs) Clairvoyant shoes looking a little little dingy, okay? (laughs) Booty call potential, you got to have your nice shoes. Anyway, and and he's taken by surprise because of that, because he didn't see it coming. Okay. It's it's in his shoes. Yeah. Okay. You would think, right? Stupid. It's 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 an obvious (laughs) one. Like, what the fuck? And listeners, because there were no witnesses other than the paintings themselves, (laughs) people speculate that he, quote, was jealous of her talent. He misunderstood her. And, oh, she was just so devastated. She stopped making work for four years. The, quote, studio visit from hell. Reverb, reverb, reverb. 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 (laughs) Okay. We are not exaggerating. This is verbatim among the sources that we came across. Okay. But let's entertain the idea that in Theosophy's worldview, he had her breast interest in mind. (laughs) Did you say breast? I said best. (laughs) Did you say breast? I said best. (laughs) Dirty. Look, play back the tape. I said bests. He said Breasts. bests. It, look, it sounds like mansplaining, okay? And that is the way it is presented to us today. Yeah. But Theosophy was a woman-led organization, and he was echoing Madame Blavatsky's teachings. Who was a woman? You know, yeah. 
Imagine walking into this artist's studios, forgetting your clairvoyant shoes, immediately kicking yourself for not packing them, and this person has painted this enormous collection of giant, colorful work with compositions that you had never even astral projected about seeing, okay? <laughs> On the outside looking in, yes, it might seem like Rudolph comes into Hilma's studio, her safe place, right? To mm-hmm. hurt her feelings, saying that her art sucks, but the truth is much more complicated than that. Trust me, listeners, I also wanted to hate Rudolph. Yeah. Okay, I really yeah. did. There are much better reasons to hate Rudolph Steiner. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so he is in way over his head here. Hilma is telling him how she made these paintings, that she's channeling these high masters, oops, as a medium, double oops, and that she doesn't know what they mean, triple oops. And she's <laughs> asking him to help her decipher them. And Senor Rudolfo doesn't know what to say about the art aspect of it because he's not an artist. He's a theosophist who mm-hmm. believes in what Madame Blavatsky taught, which you would think Blavatsky would totally be down. Cool sunglasses, thumbs up emoji with mediumship, <laughs> but... Mediumship, a word now accepted to indicate that abnormal psychophysiological state which leads a person to take the fancies of their imagination, their hallucinations, real or artificial, for realities. The medium is the passive instrument of foreign influences. The adept actively controls themselves and all inferior That which mediums see, hear, and sense is real but untrue. It is either gathered from the astral plane, so deceptive in its vibrations and suggestions, or from pure hallucinations which have no actual existence. No entirely healthy person on the physiological and psychic planes can ever be a medium. These are quotes from Blavatsky herself, including her first book, Isis Unveiled. Right out of the horse's mouth. (laughs) So remember for a moment what a medium is. A medium is a vessel. A medium is not an active participant. Mm -hmm. Hilma is presenting the idea that she opened up her unique spiritual faculties her individual cells within the astral god bod Mm -hmm. to parrot a spirit that she didn't know? Theosophy was all about finding your own spiritual faculties. Mm. You're the scientists in the lab of the astral unknowns. Your lab coat is a chore coat. You're (laughs) not here to be this fleshy mech suit piloted by some spirit named T.O. Fred. (laughs) He is also going through some big feelings, right? Like maybe a little bit of envy, a little bit of fear, (laughs) maybe a little bit of embarrassment because he thought this was a booty call. But (laughs) it does sound like Rudolfo, Senor Rudolfo, was looking out for her. Yeah, at least in this particular moment. Failed booty call attempt. Believe it or not, he did have some positive things to say. He told her which of her works had the best symbolism, in his opinion, obviously, which abstract painting was actually kind of a spiritual self-portrait. I would love to know which one that one Yeah, Why was. is that left out? Yeah. I, I would love to know that too. Yeah. He also confirmed that her paintings did indeed, quote, belong to the astral world, mm-hmm. end quote. And Rudolph would decades later develop very strong opinions about art. And maybe people conflate that with this particular meeting. At this time, his criticism was more about how she conducted her spiritual research. And listeners, all the theosophical-based research we looked at agreed with Steiner on his assessment of Hilma's work at this time. And spoiler alert, theosophical societies have no reason to back Steiner because he does some damage to theosophy in the years to come, stifling the evolution of man. Ouch. Yeah. (laughs) They're a little salty. Yeah, they're salty. They're a little salty. Because they're they're all white. Yeah, they're mostly white. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. All right. It's okay. I'm white listeners. So Hilma was devastated, but not for the reason people say. She questioned herself, the past two years of her work, everything. This, listeners, marks the beginning of a chain of events that would affect the rest of Hilma's life. First, her mother went blind and Hilma stepped up and took on the responsibility of caring for her. This meant she had to give up her prestigious studio space near the Kunstgarten. The TGI Fridays, yeah. In the arts hub of Stockholm. Yeah, well, she got one last blooming onion to go. <laughs> and she's holding it in her arms. There's like a little tear in her eye. Okay. But it's not It's not from the onion because it's fried. So okay. A lot of the punch is taken out. Of it. Usually she doesn't get it either because it's pretty unhealthy, but she thought (laughs) it's the last time I'm going to be here. So, 
Well, I mean, she's not going that and far. And you know what? She went. She went all that way. I mean, it wasn't that far. Yeah, she wasn't. She went all that way. She had to walk there, and they forgot the the <laughs> special dipping sauce. Are you idea. describing a true story? Because this sounds like something that would happen. No, I wouldn't catch it. <laughs> anyway, she packed up her things, and with a blooming onion in a to-go box, she took one last look around at her now empty studio space. <laughs> I mean, so really, like, there is something really sad about leaving a studio space, yeah. not only because they are very hard to come by, and now they are outrageously expensive, but just think about what those walls had witnessed in all those years. Mm-hmm. In the thousands of hours she spent there, and everything she had accomplished within them. At first, she moves into a studio apartment, not an art studio, just a mile or so from the Kunstgarten. Mm. And a few years later, she returns to Lake Malaren, where, as a child, she and her family would holiday. This gave Hilma time to pause and reconsider the last two years of her life. And I can't help but keep in mind that on top of everything else, Hilma is a single child-free woman in her 40s. Mm. And I'm not trying to make this about me, I swear, but <laughs> I am not her age and I get bugged constantly about my childbearing status and I'm, I'm over it. Yeah. So this was incredibly bold of her, especially at this time in Sweden, right? When suffrage movements are being shot down. And of course, people are asking her when she's going to get married. Why, why are you not married, Hilma? <laughs> Hilma, you, Hilma, you are so beautiful. I know, I know this very polite no. young man no. named Hans who owns a pony farm. Stop. No. You think you, you listeners at home think I forgot about polite Hans. You, <laughs> you were very wrong. Uh, and plus, plus, Hilma, you need a man to protect you from the murderous pony killer who lives in our city. <laughs> who is not Hans. He owns a pony farm. Why would he, why would he murder his own ponies? <laughs> it is true that he likes to I, draw little diagrams on them and, and, and pet their coats, their manes. <laughs> Please let me allow, allow me to introduce you to my very polite friend, who, Hans, no. who is not me. No. Dressed as, a, as someone <laughs> not Hans. No. Please. Excuse me. Oh, Do you know my name? Oh, you my brother? My name is Jans. You're Hans? I'm Hans. She's also freaked out by what Rudolph told her. Everything she had experienced, what was as real as taste or sight to her, these interactions with these high masters, right, right. was now all a very big question mark in her brain. And I have to imagine that she is also burned out, yeah. right? Like she turned out over a hundred paintings in two years, right? More or less. Yeah. She's not really had time to live with the work, right? To make sense of it, which is part of the artistic process. It's a classic freak out burnout scenario. Seriously. Hilma is going through so much right now, but sometimes it's these moments that make us who we are. This begins a four-year process of self-reflection, and she only makes one painting in these four years, and it's just a simple portrait. Hilma's work, clearly, if we haven't said it enough, was more than just artwork to her. She, of course, was an artist, but she was also <laughs> a researcher. She was an astral scientist. Yeah. And she trained her body to undertake her artwork, too. So she's kind of an athlete, in a way, painting this world as she was discovering it. She felt as passionately about the content of her work as did El Greco with his phantasmic biblical narratives or Frida and Diego with their prescriptions for political utopias. So she takes Senor Rudolfo's advice to heart <laughs> and this time around, listeners, Hilma would not be a passive medium. No, senor. She was la jefa now. <laughs> Her contact with the High Masters would be for guidance and spiritual visions that she would then interpret. And finally, finally, after years, she picks up those brushes and gets back to work on the paintings for the temple, filling up her canvases this time with more detailed, more conscious allegorical imagery, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of people overlook just how allegorical Hilma's work is. High Renaissance masters. <laughs> You're kind of right. Crossing from representation to ethereal shapes and forms, collected in series with subgroups numbered like scientific. Yeah research. And like the series completed before the 10 largest, it took some stumbling. Ooh, I mean, she tripped up. She, yeah, she, <laughs> yeah, there's some bad moments there, man. Seriously, I mean, Hilma's a, like, a badass painter we and it shows you up, like though. she was a little rusty. Um, <laughs> but the comeback tour started to click. Yeah. Okay, not the Defemge. This is her solo tour. Yeah. Right, right, right. Anyway, yeah. Building off of her previous work's sequential narrative, Hilma dives so much deeper. A great example of which is Group 9, a.k.a. The Swan. Told through 24, 24, 24 sequential paintings that are all connected like the most complicated puzzle ever. Interdimensional. 
three-dimensional Matryoshka puzzle with like a reference dictionary <laughs> and side quests that move molecularly while moving cosmically in a different direction. If that sounds like a lot, listeners. It is. Yeah. Okay. Grab your cafecitos. Hydrate for sure. Do some stretches. Check out all the images. All the images in the fucking charts on our web. And don't look at them early. I swear to God, if you look at them <laughs> early. On our website at artsizepod.com. Do not spoil it for yourselves. Go in order. Okay. Love you. The listeners? Yeah. Okay. An overcast noon sky reflects across a pond's metallic surface until a swan lands, fragmenting the surface reflection like a shattered mirror. The swan glides through bunches of cattails and frog bits, but suddenly comes to a stop, causing the water to ripple into shapes that look more like diagrams of electromagnetic fields than natural waves. The swan bends its long neck backwards, first pushing its wings forward, then spreading them wide as the pond's horizontal surface begins to tilt and the swan's beak collides with another's. One. All right, listeners, the swan opens with just that. Two representational swans. These are not the abstract swirls of the ten largest, but while the swans are representational, everything is painterly. Hilma's not hiding any brushstrokes or materials. The two swans are mirroring one another. One white swan with a blue beak and feet. One black swan with a yellow beak and feet. Be- beaks and feet, yes. Be- the painting immediately <laughs> reminds me of the yin and yang. Different forces that are complementary, but instead it's just those two swans instead of the, the swirling black and white, right? Yeah. The background is simple. It's evenly split. And the swans are the inverse of those backgrounds. Hmm. And they're reflecting each other's movements perfectly. Their wings and beaks touching. It's almost choreographed. Yeah. Choreographed is right. Like the astro and physical planes are on there Stephanie they're on they're on a hot date okay <laughs> okay uh and they're about to uh about to unleash some cosmic electricity you okay. know what I'm saying um, they're about to lean in mm-hmm. for a little smooch. <laughs> um, I like to think of it more as a spiritual boo. It's a smooch, a you boop. know? Yeah, smooch. Boop. I think it's a smooch. We can't know exactly what these two swans represented to Hilma, but given her history with theosophy, it's likely that Hilma was seeking connecting threads between their historical meanings. Swans are a staple of Swedish folk imagery that would have been everywhere in Hilma's day. In Norse mythology, the Valkyries guide the souls to the afterlife, Mm. and they are often depicted as swan maidens, which are human swan shapeshifters who try, but often fail, to keep themselves from being trapped in their humanly forms by creepy pervs hiding in the bushes. (laughs) Of course, of course. Yeah, of course. And the alchemists actually saw swans as this inner binary, interdimensional surfer (laughs) able to cross the physical and ethereal and back. And it was similar for many Eastern religions, that's probably where the alchemist got it, where the swan floats both in the cosmic ocean and walks amongst us on the earthly plane. In Hinduism, for example, swans are often a symbol of the highly spiritually awakened. The black swan, however, in many cultures, is an unexpected occurrence, an omen, or a deep mystery revealed within oneself that can change everything. Hilma is setting everything up in this first painting because it's going to be the last painting too. (laughs) The idea of the binary, the physical, astral, male, female, reality, reflection. Ideas that she's going going to obliterate and then reassemble. So pay attention to the black swan does appear to be an omen of some sort because at first the swans were booping Smooching. and now they're fighting. They're still mirroring one another in a now bloody choreography. Their necks and wings are knocking into one another and this looks like an action scene straight out of the pages of a comic book. Dynamic angles, action lines is very actually very Bernini-esque come to think of it. Oh my god yes. <laughs> Her paint strokes 
mirror the frenzy. They they mirror the frenzy of the frenzied mirroring. There's a lot of mirroring <laughs> going on. Becoming rhythmic, short, quick brush marks of thick paint. Three. But then the brush strokes start to swirl as the bisected background also begins to swirl. Even the background is swirling like an angular, geometric yin and yang. The two swans are now curled together, either projecting or bleeding rays of light onto one another. Together they are making almost a seed-like shape. It's a very similar shape to the seed in the final painting of the 10 mm. largest. So don't underestimate anything in these paintings. It's all choreographed. Each move anticipates the next. For example, the yellow and blue beaks and feet beaks are and beaks, also yes. swapping, blending, mixing. And honestly, <laughs> I can't tell if these birds are fighting or making love. Smooching. Smoo- smoocha, smoocharama. Okay, sorry. Boopin and smooch. <laughs> I'm trying not to read too much into this, but I read it like a struggle metaphor for her life. Definitely. I can handle myself. I can wrestle with this side of myself. Watch me. Four. The shifting of the colors of their beaks and feet, the struggle of the two swans, it all comes to a boiling point. The white swan has pulled itself from the black swan and it's soaring away. The black swan is tumbling downward. At least we think it's the black swan because the swans have become mirrors of themselves. They have swapped DNA, if you will. They each have yellow and blue feet now and their wings are turning either white or black. Five. And the next painting is a continuation of this. Gone is the black and white background. It's been replaced with four quadrants of pink, yellow, blue, and black. The swans are just floating on top of this like pieces on a board game. (laughs) Can you imagine Hilma making a board game? Oh, God, no. It would be like eight boards stacked on top of one another. <laughs> all the boards are different, They're all, but they're all interconnected. <laughs> it, it, it would be very complicated. You just described Art Slice for the last year. That is true. <laughs> That's very true. Very true. Look, we, (laughs) hey, we look for something deeper, okay? Anyway, speaking of interdimensional board games, that's right. (laughs) It's the brief return of the God Bod, baby. Okay. You didn't see that one coming. It's back. The anticipation is palpable. The faux hat animating the atoms in your precious fuzzy little ear hairs. When Hilma dissects compositions into quarters, Stephanie, we should think of it as a geometric cross. Hmm. While yes, it is a crucifix Hmm. symbol, it also has more than just that meaning. Of course. Madame Blavatsky described the significance of the cross. Stephanie, do you want to read Madame's quote here? I really tried to simplify it for you. Oh, no. Quote, two lines run in opposite directions, the horizontal and the perpendicular, which the geometrizing deity divides at the intersecting point. So the geometrizing (laughs) deity is a harmonization of the dual forces of nature. Theosophy really likes to think in terms of binaries, so inwards and outwards, centri- <laughs> centripetal, Centri- oh, fuck. centripetal, centripetal, oh, it's <laughs> centripetal, 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 that's it. <laughs> Centripetal and centrifugal. Centrifugal. Centripetal and centrifugal. And centrifugal. Centrifugal. (laughs) Anyway, that's not a real thing. Centrifugal is. Okay. Yeah, just ask, you know, Faith Hill about this kiss. That's in this kiss? Kiss. Centrifugal. Oh, no. But we literally (laughs) see this play out with the swans here. Continuation quote. This cross (laughs) forms the magical and scientific quaternary. Quaternary. Forms the magical and scientific quaternary Quaternary. (laughs) scientific quaternary that when inscribed with the perfect square is the basis of the occultist. Jesus. Okay, so basically they're the principles of the cosmos and the physical bodies. It's more complicated than just that, but these are very important elements to this belief. All right, let's continue. Yes, please. Within the geometric crosses, mystical precinct lies the master key which opens the door of every science, physical as well as spiritual. Did you hear the winky face? It's, yes. Okay. It symbolizes our existence for the circle of life circumscribes the four points of the cross, which represent in succession, birth, life, death, and immortality. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. That was beautiful. You're welcome. I feel a little bit powerful for some reason. Okay. A little bit invincible. Real quick, Stephanie, mm-hmm. can we agree these two paintings got away from Hilma here? Ooh, they they are not the best examples <laughs> of her work, like, at all. Mm. And they are often omitted from exhibitions because of this. They really fall apart. And not in, like, a cool, beautiful way. <laughs> 
it's more of like an afterthought way. I want to go on the record to state that while these are not great paintings, Mm -hmm. we don't agree with their omission. Right. Just like how we couldn't separate the ecstasy of St. Teresa from the gaudy gaudiness surrounding it, (laughs) I don't think these should be separated. You can't mix and match them either. They're supposed to be sequential. They are sequential. They're stories, goddammit. Six. However... These next two paintings are some of the best. All of a sudden, there are four swans. Paths. Yes, paths of swans. Paths of swans. <laughs> and earmuffs vegans. These swans are cut down the center of the beak all the way to the tail. Cut down. And what's that? It is our old friend, the spiral. Oh. It's back again. It's touching each swan half and spiraling towards the center where there is this little egg or nugget or or something. something. <laughs> the swan halves are all trying to bite at this little egg nug or heart. It just kind of looks like a heart. And yes, while there is a spiral, it is overlapping the four quadrant cross, which are the lines that make up the spiral and separate the quadrant and their alternating colors. <laughs> Blue, yellow, red, white. Why do we keep mentioning these colors? Listeners, you'll soon find out. Seven. But what's this, Stephanie? A fifth swan has entered the chat. <laughs> and I don't know how to describe this, listeners. The fifth swan half is trying to merge with another swan yeah, half. Well, a real King Ghidorah thing happening here. I love it. But they've kept their individual necks and heads. Everything in the composition has shifted 15 degrees, making an X and Instead of a cross. I'm sure that's nothing. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and if your alarm bells aren't going off yet, this is a sign that things are really starting to move in unexpected ways. Events are happening. But when and where are they happening? Are they happening at the same time as the first few paintings? Is this another dimension entirely? So many we questions. Don't know. Eight. The swans gone, sort of. <laughs> The interesting colors gone, sort of. The cubes that divided the composition also gone, sort of. (laughs) We are back to the bisected black and white background from the first few paintings. But instead of black and white swans, we have the cubes being orbited by halos of more cubes. And these seem very hand-drawn. Like they are not the precision geometric painting we're used to from Hilma. These are a little bit more immediate. (laughs) They're more like melting ice cubes. Yeah, she's got to go. Hilma is in a hurry. Well, it's because their ice cubes are melting. So before we dive into the atomic acid trip deep end, listeners, let's quickly recap. The crystal clear binary that we started with, black and white coats, blue, yellow beaks and feet, is now (laughs) unstable. The identical yet inverted swans were first curious, curious enough to uh, lean in for a little swan smooch, (laughs) but then immediately resistant because they realized it was starting to remix their binaries, okay? <laughs> and they lost themselves forever in that moment. It was it's kind of a Garden of Eden situation. Taking a big old smoochy, Kissing apples. smoochy bite out of that apple. <laughs> While these swans are dealing with an identity and molecular crisis, <laughs> Hilma is also wrestling with her previous way of making work. Before the four-year break, she was a little bit more painterly, albeit with that precision touch, but her work always hinted at sacred diagrams or maps or sequential narratives. They were abstract to our eyes, but not necessarily abstract to her eyes. Right. I really like the idea of Helma's paintings as allegorical, and so far, in this one, we've seen her owning these narrative painterly diagrams. Mm. So let's finally talk about her coded colors. The swans, beats and beaks, beaks and feats, beats and beaks. <laughs> they were blue and yellow. And for her, this meant male and female. Green being a fusion of those two energy binaries. And there is this pink that keeps showing up. And she described this as a spiritual love. But as we've seen, those colors on the swan are not stable. They're swapping or they have both. In her own 1900s way, I think she's showing us some fluidity, showing us mm-hmm. that we possess a spectrum within us. Right. And as a reminder, Mind your listeners, Hilma was a female trailblazer, one of the first females to study at art school. She had her group of female mediums in Defem. Her death metal band, yeah. <laughs> She followed a religion that had outspoken feminist leaders, many of them with a history in suffrage movements. And of course, she was making this bold ass work. Okay, she wasn't afraid of no guinies. 
No guinies. I mean, Stephanie, she had her own spiritual guinie that she could just kind of <laughs> astral project onto her body, you know? You okay. Know, from, from an adult novelty store, I'm just saying. Offer code ArtsPod at, at smoochandpeaches.gov. Oh the adult novelty store. Nine. Another standout here, this is a stunner. You have that yellow and blue swooping into this composition, <laughs> sliding down this cube water park slide sort of thing straight into a propeller, very similar to the propellers, of course, in the 10 largest. And that propeller is mixing them all up. And mm. you can tell because there are little dashes and lines of yellow and blue being spun around it. We are seeing the binary of the opening painting being taken apart and rearranged yes. and then reestablishing itself and then being taken apart part again and blend it together, you know, to make a more harmonious beast. Yeah, 10. Now we have zoomed into what is on the other side of that propeller. Behind some one-sided glass observation room. <laughs> <laughs> and we are witnessing the moment that these swans begin to meld, shown in two identical gradations of white to black coats. Painted as these beautiful undulating feathers. Then there are all these little symbols. Uh, they yeah, kind of, you know, they could look like spermies a little bit. Symbols you might have seen in the <laughs> 10 largest, caught in the gentle wind of that propeller. <laughs> and then there's this little cube on the bottom right corner. Like, where did that cube come from? It's a uh, Deus Ex Machina cube, Stephanie. Excuse me? It's going to be important later, listeners. Mm. Don't you worry about it. So, yes, we are near the halfway point, listeners, and my mind, our minds, your minds need a break. And uh, by break, we actually mean we're going to contemplate the invention and definition <laughs> of abstract art. Just a little light segment. Okay, Professor. Professor. Opening its doors in the early days of May 1914, the Baltic Exhibition highlighted the best art, industrial designs, and crafts from Sweden, Denmark, Russia, and Germany. Basically, this was like a World's Fair, but listeners. Just, you know, reduced to the Baltic region, a part, <laughs> a part of the World's Fair. Yeah, it was kind of exclusive. Yeah. Yes, definitely. But in the art wing specifically, there were naturalistic works like those by Hilma herself. Mm. But there were, of course, also modernists pushing the boundaries of art like Kirchner, oh. Alexei von Jelensky, Sigrid Hjerten, another female Swedish painter, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Alexei uh, played songs from the Baltic region. <laughs> sorry, stupid. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Okay, I love it. Um, that's a legit name, just so you know. Yeah. So you could imagine Hilma, if and when she did find time to travel the five plus hour train ride to Malmo. Because we don't know for sure that she went to this. Right. But we assume, and I think it's probably likely that she did. So we can imagine her patiently walking through the quiet gallery halls, finding work that she clicked with, giving work that she did not, the, <laughs> the polite amount of time. Uh, statistically, 15 seconds. Is that true? I think that's right. It's 14 or 15 seconds. Okay, I remember, yeah. yeah. Make sure I scan the whole composition and then not uh. politely. She's taking her time. She's judging in the works but you know Russell I wish I could just pop into her brain the moment that she saw the completely non-representational abstractions of Vasily Kandinsky's mm. which would have been the first time that many people saw a fully abstract work I mean like what did she think when she saw those <laughs> so it'd be funnier if she was looking for a meaning and symbols and structures like in her own work some sort of like codex that she could crack the case with but I mean like she wasn't a dipshit it. <laughs> I mean, she was surrounded by contemporary art, yeah. so she probably understood it immediately. She probably just saw it as a natural progression of contemporary work at that time. Eventually, they're going to lose the subject matter, right? Right. Even if she didn't completely, you know, understand what he was painting, she could gel with it. Yeah, she gets yeah, it. I she see, gets I it. I see what you're doing. I mean, I think she probably found a lot of similarities with her and Vasily's work, for sure. Stephanie, it's been a while since we uh, discussed one Vasily Kandinsky. Mm -hmm. Why don't you uh, set the stage? 
message for us. Okay. Or, you know, just give us a brief backstory. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll try to do a little bit of okay, both. Okay. In 1896, at the age of 30, this lawyer turned artist mm. when he got that haystack feeling <laughs> from a Monet painting and he embraced the edge of art almost immediately. Mm. He was on a similar path, an adjacent path to Hilma, albeit his own. Like Hilma, color had spiritual meaning to him. He categorized its effect and he even painted with that in mind. He was a synesthesist. He felt these colors deeply, profoundly. Theosophy was also a significant source of inspiration. Mm. One day, he saw one of his own paintings tipped to the side. Oh no, who knocked it over? Mm. Uh, <laughs> And he was shocked by how you could just appreciate colors and forms as colors and forms. <laughs> there wasn't a need for the artist to depict something recognizable. Right. This seems like obvious to us. Yeah. Um, but we got a real inventor of the light bulb moment here because some of Vasily's artist peers were also on their way towards total abstractions. But by 1910, 1912, depending on who you ask, Vasily made the first, quote, abstract painting. Mm. Four to six years after Hilma of Clint had started making the work that to our eyes looks abstract, which mm -hmm. has sparked a debate on whether or not Hilma should be listed as the first abstract artist. What do you think, Stephanie? I think it's complicated. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's work our way backwards because this is kind of a cluster. 122-ish years ago, <laughs> depending on when you're listening to this, was really the start of major discoveries that would change the world. Electricity was introduced, psychology, x-rays, radio waves, atoms media, travel, that opened the window to other ways of seeing different cultures, other ways of life. Mm -hmm. So there was this expansion of the possibilities in the imagination of people. For better or for worse. For, for better or for worse. And it also pried the door open to the possibility of more discoveries to be found. And as a result of this, artists like Vasily Kandinsky were able to look inward, look at the world, and paint the unseen. A few years prior to that, Our Lady of Purpose, Hilma Off Clint, very much inspired by exactly all of those things, is doing the same thing in secrecy mm -hmm. in her own way. Yeah. She was having her own haystack feeling. Then, like we mentioned in the first Hilma episode and the Agnes Pelton episode, a few years before all of these artists in 1901, you had the book Thought Forms, which artists like Vasily and Hilma, who were already a part of these theosophical societies, were likely some of the first people to consume. And Thought Forms, while not intending to at all, laid out out a clear method for abstraction. Winky face. <laughs> I don't want to give it all away. Winky face. Thought forms and then think about the little winky face emoji next to it. <laughs> and this is where the idea of what constitutes an abstraction gets tricky because a clairvoyant could allegedly understand these forms as thoughts or emotions. So to that clairvoyant, it would be representational, not abstract, while appearing abstract to us. But even before all of that... <laughs> In 1860, you have Georgiana Houghton making non-representational work, once again, to our eyes, yeah. once again, from the spirit world that she actually went ahead and exhibited to the general public, and which critics <laughs> did not like, calling it, quote, a gallery of painful absurdities. Jesus. It's sad and ludicrous. She's that's savage. <laughs> yeah. I guarantee you that there are plenty of other artists that we will never know because about. Because they saw that review in like the London Times. They're like, nope, I'm going to put these back in the drawer. Probably, probably. Yeah. And the world's not ready. Steve, the abstract medium artist. <laughs> There might be some that will surface that made non-representational-ish work probably before any of these characters. Definitely, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I like to extend the idea of what abstract is a little bit further than that because tens okay. of thousands of years before all of this, you have cave paintings in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. You have patterned etchings on ostrich shells in South Africa. Some probably shamanistic, often they look non-representational once again to our eyes. And so my whole thing here is what we can touch is just as real as a thought. Mm -hmm. And making from that, regardless of the influence, whether it's whether it's drugs or neurodivergencies or even mediumship, shamanism, whatever, all of that comes from connecting what we experience to what we take away from that experience and make into something. <laughs> Which brings us to this documentary we watched with this curmudgingly yeah. abstract artist. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, he had a resting curmudgeon face. Like we started calling him the resting curmudgeonly face dude. So RCFD. Yeah, that's what we yeah. started calling yeah. him. Um, so he was just explaining away Hilma's place in the canon. It went exactly how you think it would. Abstraction is pure from yourself. It's untouchable. <laughs> Not from some lunatic <laughs> illustrating a spirit world. Uh, please be sure to push up your uh, tiny glasses. your tiny foggy glasses <laughs> as they slide down your greasy face. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sweaty face, sweaty face. Sorry, sweaty face. That's what I meant, sweaty face. He was getting hot and bothered. <laughs> okay, keep in mind that RCFD here is just illustrating a process for abstraction. He also learned in art school. I mean, they both went to art school. Right. Once again, experiencing and taking away from that experience. The art world is often intimidated by one's presence near it. There are lists of caveats and checklists to exclude people from clubs that the members believe they themselves have earned a place in. Being able to clearly categorize and canonize protects the investors of such artworks as well. Like that's another big side to this, okay? Yep. They're not going to like it if that painting they purchased at Sotheby's for 40 fucking million dollars suddenly loses uh, some of its ROI. Recognizing Hilma or Georgiana Houghton or thought forms in canons or categories presents a major problem to these institutions because mm -hmm. they do not sit cleanly into the narrative that has been constructed. And the narrative that RCFD was parroting. Right. However... <laughs> <laughs> I agree with RCFD. I do too. Because I do not think Hilma cared at all about no. being canonized or categorized in the same way Kandinsky clearly did. It meant a lot to him. Kandinsky sought it out. He was obsessed. Yeah. He was obsessed. He really was. <laughs> and this is not a diss on no. Kandinsky at all. What he did was amazing and important to him personally and to so many artists who would later follow. Yeah. But it is incredible to see Hilma's work, and it needs to be said, a woman yeah. beating the major abstract artists of the 20th century to the punch. Mm. But those works were cherry-picked out of larger... Allegorical bodies of work they are connected to just like in The Swan. Which is why the clickbait of Hilma being the first abstract artist who also spoke to ghosts <laughs> has always left a bad yeah. taste in our mouths here at Art Slice HQ. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she was so much bigger than all of that. Clearly yeah. she was diving into the abstract pool regardless of what RCFD says mm -hmm. before a lot of people did and in different ways. But that wasn't her destination. Right. It was just a stop along the way. Mm -hmm. And honestly in my mind, she fits in more clearly with artists like Bernini or Mar Marcel Duchamp. <laughs> I always want to do that going into that voice. Mar but Gale. both of who had a more expansive way of making work, who thought scientifically, psychologically, experientially yeah. on all these different levels. Yeah, they were concerned <laughs> about the world and space that their art was living yeah, in. Yeah. And yeah. they used all that and used the recognizable with the vexing to truly impact the viewer. Eleven. So, listeners, when we last left the swan, we were migrating between the parallel stages or planes, or mm -hmm. honestly, who knows? Yeah. Uh, a small geometric cube, symbols, and gradating swan coats were all blowing in the gentle breeze of a propeller. Beautiful. Yes. So, just a dip in the astral abstract pool. Of course, of course. All of these terms are kind of running together for me. Yeah, that'll happen. But we're about to dive in. Yeah. All yeah. right. Hey, Steph, will you hand me that beach towel over there? The one next to the uh, the shoes. Okay, here you go. Oh, oh. <laughs> what? Stephanie, you just knocked over that shoe. Oh, I did? And oh. like somebody trying to hide their keys within their shoes while at the pool, you've... So, they tumbled out and... It's like, oh, it's the Return of the God Bot, baby! <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All I can come up with. <laughs> Not your best work. It's back again, listeners. You could feel it in your chore-coated bones. It's time <laughs> to check in with our friends at the Theosophical Society, double and triple checking that their astral umbilical cords are still tethered to their mortal <laughs> bodies before plunging into the depths of the ethereal. A nice extended weekend vacation, right? 
They requested Friday and Monday off to do this. You know, it's going to be, you know, they're maximizing that PTO. Okay. Anyway, yes, 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 yes. Any Bassant and CW Leadbeater's book agent was like, hey, you two, it's time to write a follow up to Thought Forms. So in 1908, <laughs> they released Occult Chemistry, a book that finds their spiritual faculties so thoroughly yoked that they <laughs> allegedly shrank their etheric vision to subatomic levels of perception. Okay. So imagine them floating right along, like in Fantastic Voyage, hmm. but much smaller. Line. I don't know what that is, but I'll take your word for it's it. It's an old movie. Okay. Running into a cast of characters, cubes, star-shaped gases, <gasps> tetrahedrons. I want my gas to be star-shaped. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving that in. Okay. No, yeah? okay. cut it. Isotope spikes, etc., etc. And what a quinky dink. They discovered <laughs> that just like Blavatsky wrote 40 years earlier, even at subatomic levels, there is a harmonization between the dueling forces. They love those harmonious love binary forces. Oh, they love it. And in this case, the physical and ethereal elements made up of layers upon layers of spiraling, indivisible, elementary particles, gendered, of course, male, female, negative, positive, which they named the Anu, after the ancestor of all deities. Of, of course. course. Yeah, of course. Of course. And listeners, occult chemistry like Thought Forms was accompanied by just these gorgeous illustrations, all the star-shaped gases you could want. <laughs> In this case, is very sciencey, very diagrammatic. Diagrammatic, yeah. And to <laughs> Theosophy's credit, once this was all debunked by science, because definitely it was, <laughs> they did stop publishing the book for a long time. But I mentioned this all to say that this idea of etheric onion peel traveling is starting to show up in the swan. Mm -hmm. And you can see Hilma start to meld her own visual language with this highly diagrammatic look. It's dope. You gonna... Oh, right, the paintings. <laughs> <laughs> Eleven. Last we left the swan, we were migrating between the parallel stages. The propeller was churning, spinning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That small geometric cube that appears the Deus Ex Machina style thing, I think. <laughs> we're now witnessing the insides of that little cube. Yeah. Okay, sneak peek. The composition is again cut into a cross quad. This would be yet another forgettable painting in the series if it wasn't for the wait for it. Wait for it, okay. The second smaller cube right in the center containing a quad sected swirling rainbow of course, circle. Of course, of course. A psychedelic jawbreaker stuff. Or <laughs> Hell yeah. a jawbreaker that's been soaked in psychedelics. You choose. Both. The swirl. <laughs> twists and like a playful kitten who makes your podcast late presents uh, to you its black and white tummy. Yeah. Don't pet it though. Don't yeah. get too close. But just to remind us we are still connected <laughs> to those OG swans. Well, as we move along it's going to get harder to describe what's going on. There are two sand dollar shapes mm. mirroring one another mm. and they are projecting from their centers prismatic rays onto one another. Similar in subject, form, and color to painting number three, where the swans are engaged in some, uh, we'll call it amorous prismatic projection. Okay, <laughs> feel free to use that, listeners. I, I mean, look at these side by side. For real. 13. The next painting, the bisected black and white halves, have merged into one circle. Yeah, that's, you know, because they're projecting rays onto one another. Two have become uno. And we see, of course, yellow and blue again, and pink outlining the rays that have now flipped. And they seem to be recalling the bisected booping Smooching. point yeah. of the first painting. They look like the beaks coming in for a smooch. Yes, yeah. yes. It's so easy to get caught up in every little detail happening in these paintings that you almost forget that these are paintings, right? They're, right. But these last two paintings especially are stunners. Like the symmetry, mm -hmm. I don't recall seeing this one in person, but it looks like there is some translucent layering happening, which makes it read like a patinaed surface reflecting something crystal clear. Mm. I'm getting desert, mirage, Vision vibs a la <laughs> Agnes Pelton. I was I was gonna say it. Yeah. You said it. Yeah. Fourteen. The next painting is one of Hilma's most minimal. So you can catch your breath finally. Solid black background with an almost white circle in the center, and I say almost because yes, you guessed it. There are very subtle rays of the same blue, yellow, and pink from this whole series. 
but specifically from the last painting's mm. triangle. Are they emanating from that same triangle, Russell? Probably. Yes, of course they are. Of course. Although, now that the triangle has been shrunk down to, what were their names? Their names? Yeah. Oh, Annie Besson and C.W. Leadbeater? Yes, shrunken down um, to those two. They, they, you have to go much smaller. I mean, we're talking subatomic. Smaller. My fingers are smaller. pressing down together. Smaller. Smush really your fingers hard. together. It hurts. Okay. <laughs> 15. Next painting. Same circle. Same size. Not the same tiny triangle. Okay, <laughs> now it's the two triangles back to back uh, from a few paintings ago. Half white, half black, because swans. Of course, okay? of course. But now, within the circle, a cross-quad square mm. appears, of course. And within said cross-quad square... <laughs> All four corners are touching the parameter of the circle. You mean the circle of life that circumscribes the four points of the geometricized cross, which represents in succession life, death, birth, and immortality? In the Padre, in the Padre. In the nombre del Padre, el Hijo del Espíritu. We're going off the deep end, listeners. <laughs> Glad you joined us. 16. On to the next painting, which is a stunner, a showstopper. We made a sticker of it, artsexpod.com, some, some time ago when we thought we were going to release this a little bit sooner. <laughs> shh, shh. Okay. It's in, the, it's in a pizza box. It's not like, you know, it's not like this exactly. I know. But listeners, this is probably one of Russell's top five favorite paintings. Yeah, maybe top 10, yeah. Then we all know yeah. Russell. He's got his opinions. So yeah. this is a big deal. Same circle size, same recurring colors, same black background, but the circle has been split this time into five parts, mm. keeping us on our toes. Mm. Three half circles on one side, mm. two on the other, with another teeny tiny triangle in the center. The decision Hilma made to leave the inner circle out of that right half is just, oof, oof, feels so good. No scientific <laughs> explanation needed. It just fe- it just feels good, Stephanie. That's good. Just fe- it's intuitive. It feels, feels good. Feels are good. Yeah. Intu- intuition is and the, good. D- you know, the dig on her work is often that it becomes too much of a diagram of an idea. And sometimes that's definitely true. I've like, we We've had to sit here for weeks, months, almost a year, trying to figure out how all of these paintings correlate, what these symbols are, how do they sync up, et cetera, et cetera. But then she pulls away and you have a minimal, simple, perfect painting like this. I'm sure it's a diagram, but it's it doesn't matter in this moment. Pretty perfect. But it's also perfect because of the 15 paintings that preceded it and the eight that will follow. It's still a diagram (laughs) because hiding amongst all of that simplicity (sighs) is another triangle. Mm -hmm. This time it's going downwards. 17. And like in the very next painting. That's a fucking Matryoshka doll. (laughs) Which is an inversion of the same circle before it. The background is this earthy reddish purple. So good. But she is painting this pure red on on top of it in spurts. It's so subtle, but taking a step back and deciding that these particular color combinations make a painting hum, make it vib, make it vibrate. <laughs> Next to that blue, that is precision color surgery. That is all artists right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 18. Next up, the last time we're going to see this particular circle. So let's enjoy the encore. Clap, clap, clap. Okay. <laughs> the background is a washy orange umber now. Very fuego vibes. I'm getting hot. It's no longer bisected. There are five Five whole rings of those same colors, same, I guess, symbol with the three rays emanating from it. Yeah, pink, blue, yellow. Sure. Course, of course. All the things. Put in a blender. Come out in a blender, something oblivion. <laughs> You sound more like System of a Down, but yeah. Fuck. Okay. God, music was so... Speaking of bad... <laughs> 19 and 20. Evolving. De-evolving. Woof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like we said, often segments of this series are omitted from museum exhibitions. Some for good reason. And these two paintings are almost always the first to go. <laughs> this is not a good painting, folks. <laughs> Just remember, even at Hilma off Clint's level, sometimes you make bad ones. You do. You make some stinkers. You, you these do. are in the stinker categories. They can't all be home runs, you know? Yeah. But as much of an eyesore as these paintings are, they are indeed <laughs> setting up the next big moment. So in both, the canvas is again cross-quartered, mm-hmm. but now with a diagonal cross or an X laid atop. An X squad. Yes. Yeah, a cross X squad. Wait, a cross quad X squad. <laughs> I'm sure that's nothing. Uh, in both paintings, <laughs> a spirally nautical shell back from the 10 largest is rotating out of the center. Slow-mo, baby. 21. Hilma has lured us into a skeptical lull with the last two paintings, listeners, only because she is about to bludgeon us with some of the <laughs> best work from this series. Listeners, buckle in. Buckle in. Buckle in. Yeah, buckle um, in. We're about to go out with a bang. Yeah, we're about to go out with a bang from the nautical uh, existence plane. Something nautical. The, something, 
jump the canonical here. Not a. We got, what we're trying to say is we got two uh, swirls here. So, swirls. Yes, vanilla soft serve. Okay, they look a lot like soft serve ice cream spiraling oh, out man. of a nozzle. Listeners, have you ever stuck your head under one of those automatic ice cream machines? Can't say no. that I have. Okay, well that's what I'm imagining. Okay. okay, so the inanimate soft serve swirls have become animate. <laughs> <laughs> They've grown faces, translucent geometric cube faces that have turned to look at one another. How cute. They're like, Hola. Yeah. and of course, they are being propelled by four course, fleshy pink propeller blades. The cube faces are made up of half solid and half dashed lines. Kind of like some early Ikea manual <laughs> for clicking these two cubes together. And that's not a Swedish thing, Stephanie. I want to make that very clear. Okay, thank you. One has, of course, the yellow lines. The other one has, of course, the blue lines, of course, of course, of course. The cross quad and X quad are the structural support for these cubes. Mm. And then hidden within the propeller's center Mm -hmm. is another cross quad X quad. That's so hard to say. And why do we keep seeing these cross X quads? We're getting to it. Okay, we're yeah. going to get to this. And there is this beautiful washy black background with mm. varying translucency and opacity. It kind of looks like charcoal dissolving in water, a little bit like a, like an acid wash jeans texture. Oh. You, get, you see that? I do. Okay. To remind us, listeners, before we get into some serious diagrammy shit, <laughs> Hilma is not just a diagramming, molecular, blending, spirit spiritual traveler. Okay. She's a paintbrush wielding assassin painter. <laughs> okay, she's she, what I'm trying to say is she's a painter. She's a badass yeah, painter. Yeah, she's, she's a painter. 22. The next painting is a large transparent cube that consumes almost the entire canvas, only leaving the corners as right triangles. Mm. Ask me how I know. How do you know, Stephanie? I had to take geometry twice in high school. <laughs> oh, okay, so you, do, so you don't know about right triangles. I do know. Well, now you know. I should yeah. know I took it twice. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Maybe those two cubes have followed their IKEA instruction manuals and have snapped into <laughs> one unified cube yeah. because the dashed lines are gone. Up until this point, Hilma seems to have broken down these two swans, hijacked them, dragged them back to an astral chop shop. <laughs> And now she is starting to build everything back, albeit in in a new way, starting with dimensions. Barely noticeable white and black crosses splice through this geometric cube ceiling and floor. Quad and X crosses, again, in such a way that it's getting harder and harder for us to ignore that there's a symbol emerging. Yeah, there is a a symbol, a, a pathway emerging. Hang with us here through this stretch, listeners. Oh, God. Because... That's right, listeners. Oh, no. It's the return of the return of the return of the return <laughs> of the God Bod, baby. You thought two God Bods were a perfect harmony, Stephanie, a perfect bread binary, encasing the meats and cheeses and mayonnaises <laughs> of this episode. You saw that set of six footprints in the sand where you walked with the two God Bods. And you thought you were walking with the two God Bods. You were wrong, listeners. You were never walking in the sand. There was always a third God Bod, uh-huh. a middle God Bod, uh-huh. equalizing the God Bod binaries, carrying you the entire way. And it's here where we lost our marbles. Why are you looking at me like listeners. that? Listeners. Okay. Making Art Slice <laughs> is just as much about us trying to understand how these artists saw the world. And as artists, we really try to put ourselves in their shoes. The clairvoyant shoes, yes. Okay. <laughs> In the final hour, we realized this was right in front of our faces the entire time. Yeah, Hilma off Clint concurrent to (laughs) Group 9, the swan, was working on the W series. (laughs) Illustrative, Art Nouveau-inspired watercolors that diagrammed her own interpretation of the Tree of Knowledge, most notably from the Judeo-Christian book of Genesis, where, quote, the Lord God grew amongst all other trees, the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, and the Tree of Life, end quote. That was also paraphrased. <laughs> now, the tree of knowledge gets all the attention. Eve met Snake. Snake's like, hey, yo, you want to ditch? This place is nice, but it's giving me the creeps. And Eve <laughs> was like, hell yeah. Lips to apple, <laughs> a different smooching point. The tree of life, though, is often totally forgotten about. And I don't know about you, Stephanie, and your Catholic upbringing, but in my Christian upbringing, I never heard about the tree of life. No, everyone always bitched about Eve. Yeah. Despite being the key to the mystical Abrahamic worldview of Kabbalah, with a K, a Q, a C, whatever you want to do. One one that did not escape theosophy. And why would Our Lady of Purpose not be investigating the Tree of Life along with the Tree of Knowledge? Yeah, she's really into those binaries. Why not, right? She's basically the patron saint of thoroughness. (laughs) 
2023. Now in her most crystallized moment in the entire series, that normal old cross and X quad <laughs> translucent cube suddenly expands vertically to include a third level in the center, the very top and bottom, both containing circles filled with beautiful pie slices of gradating colors, mm. light pastel on top, darker saturated below, as if the color above is being projected to the floor. And it's really here where you realize throughout the entire series there was always an energy between the two forces mm. in the thin line between the point of smooch. Oop. Okay, well, yeah, okay. The Kubala Tree of Life is a sacred diagram for the ever-cycling harmony between every speck of matter in every plane of existence, micro, macro, physical, astral. It's everything. People study it their entire lives, mm -hmm. or, or they briefly Google search it after watching Neon Genesis Evangelion, <laughs> which is what I did. The shapes, pathways, colors, and numbering systems match this 23rd painting almost perfectly. The Tree of Life is complex, and it's applied differently to different ideologies, and we simply cannot dig into this in any meaningful way. But let's show you why we not only see Hilma representing it here, but we also see parts of its message in the swan told through a Hilma-filtered mm. lens. Okay, so the swan, like the Tree of Life, illustrates the theosophical belief that we are indeed these matryoshka dolls of spirit and matter all the way down to our binary atoms. But it goes a little bit further and explains how those binary atoms propelling and repelling keep themselves from combusting. Oh. In almost every painting of the swan, there is this fragile and tentative choreography. Mm. It, it's like any painting could fall apart at any moment. <laughs> like one move, one smooch lands wrong, <laughs> it's falling apart to a point where I start to get a little anxious looking at certain paintings in this series. But instead, Hilma shows us that things that seem seem contradictory or actually interdependent. There is a larger framework at play. And in a very Hilma off point way, <laughs> she is giving us an allegorical diagram of that infinite, vast framework. But it never feels like one. Right. Because she's just such an incredible mm. artist. Even in the most diagrammatic moments, you have to remind yourself that you're looking at layers and layers of meaning, not an abstract painting. So the Tree of Life has 10 to 12, depending on your reading, color, divine, energy spheres, starting with the top, divinity, spiraling its way down through three pillars, at least 22 pathways <laughs> to the tree's roots, right? Our physical world, connecting spirit and matter. The pathways are the building blocks of everything. Like we said, they travel from sphere to sphere, connecting pillar to pillar from the evolution of our world to our own spiritual evolution. The right and left pillars are those binaries we've been mentioning throughout the episode. The swans, the yin and yang, the sub, the fugu, the, 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 the Faith Hill shit. <laughs> All these ideas have a kind of implied harmony between them. But Hilma, through her coded colors, is showing us that the binary is not just a mm. static pillar that we either are or are not. Well, and that is because of that smooching point. <laughs> the third <laughs> pillar, it's an equilibrium, a stabilizing between the two binaries, but also a path for them to exchange and unify. Mm -hmm. In the swan specifically, it's very small, <laughs> even completely unseen, but it's a harmony. You know, the little triangles, the propellers. Mm. It's different in each painting, but there is always a third force. Right. And then finally, in this 23rd painting, we actually see clear distinction and equality between the now three forces. They're geometric, all the same shapes and sizes, visually showing us they are just as important to the structure, even when they are unseen. And really, all the spiritualities and philosophical thoughts, it was very common for things to be gendered. They really buy into this idea that there has to be opposing sides to make things flow. So, like every Everything else we've talked about today, the right and left pillars in the Tree of Life are thought of as gendered. But Hilma seems to have made her own conclusion. She is not just parodying right. Theosophy or the Tree of Life. She's showing you her interpretations, her own spiritual exploration and intuition. And she shows us the swans, always on equal footing, mm. swapping those gendered colors. And if you look at the ideologies and leaders of Theosophy, for example, for all the weird spiritual manifest destiny shit they do and all the fucking playing footsie with eugenics through oh your God. root race theory, they were big asterisk 
for the time, progressive. <laughs> yeah, Big asterisk. Right. Your soul would reincarnate as you evolved towards that god bod. And thus, it would not be unusual for your soul to pick up experiences from a spectrum of lives lived from all sorts of different walks of life, from all different types of identities. Mm. Qualities that are now inherent within your soul. Like, you've picked them up, you absorb them. So while they use gendered language, there is a lot of nuance here. Hilma knows that we all possess a spectrum within ourselves, and she even wrote about this idea idea that we are just as much our fathers as we are our mothers. We contain them, they contain us, and that a necessary and freeing evolution for humans would be to understand what is behind the veil of man and woman. And that includes ideas of gender nonconformity, which today might fall under the genderqueer umbrella. Right. Hilma wanted her works to teach the future. She was always thinking beyond herself and the narrow-minded society that she lived in. But what's so great is that you can still see her own experiences in The Swan while she's broadcasting this universal message to a wider audience. So we said the first painting is also the last painting and well, it is and it isn't. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> instead of a flat, binary, black and white background, we have a painterly spectrum of quad colors, a transition from the tree of life divinity and earth above and below. The swans, instead of being at odds, are balancing each other's ebbs and flows. They're locked together in a propeller form, mm. looking a lot like the pink propeller blades <laughs> from just a few paintings ago. Their necks are twisted into an infinity-like symbol. Their beaks are sharing a key to their new house, their new casa yeah. on Godbot Ave. <laughs> <laughs> and within this glowing key, we can see clearly an OG Tree of Life diagram and less of Hilma's geometricized interpretation. It's clear that the micro and macro, or the swans and the world, have found harmony and unity within the infinite, and their propeller shape now is the symbol of a continuing cycle. And much like the last painting in the 10 largest series, this last painting suggests that things are not ending, but are only just beginning. They've got a, they've got a lot more switchbacks to climb, <laughs> you know, as they climb up that tree of life. They could just fly, but... That's true, actually. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny, right? Okay. <laughs> so, listeners, we did already give you some of our thoughts on the swan throughout the episode, but I was just wondering, Russell, what are your overall feelings about the swan? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so this was a difficult needle to thread. I mean, making an allegorical, diagrammatic, saturated work feel so magical. Oh my God, yes. And I think Hilma is able to do this because of her passion and experience is also told through these. So when we finally saw these in order for the first time, yeah. because even the Guggenheim couldn't even put the works that they did select from this series in order. Right, oh my God. What we took away from it without ever hearing about theosophy was essentially where we landed after researching this on and off for nine months. Oh my God, right. So to me, while some of the works are hit and miss, and there, there are definitely some bad ones in there, but <laughs> there really are. It's a total success overall. I mean, she had a lot to say. Hilma was very aware that she lived in a world of dichotomies, mm -hmm. which limited her role in society. And I honestly find it comforting that someone, even 107 years ago, 
more or less, um, <laughs> was thinking about these polarities and dreaming of a world in which we could come to accept and embrace our true nature as humans, right. which is broader than we allow ourselves to be because we get in our own way. Yeah, definitely. But Hilma is saying we have the key. We are home. We just need to learn how to unlock our potential. <laughs> we need to learn how to stop de-evolving. Seriously. <laughs> it need... feels like we keep de-evolving. <laughs> And it seems like the art world was just embarrassed to present Hilma as she truly was, which is a utopian-minded occultist. I mean, let's be real about that. Yeah. Because honestly, a lot of these terms and symbols have been adapted by New Age culture. Mm. I mean, that this is the root of it, right? <laughs> and sorry, <laughs> they're more familiar to us as objects in like the Simpsons' karmaceutical story. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But those same people do everything to avoid talking about the utopian communism of yep. Frida and Diego or Leonora Carrington and Remedios Varro's witchcraft, of which they were all proud mm. and very vocal, but they don't bat an eye at the deeply religious artists like Bernini right. or Hieronymus Bosch. Right, right. And Rudolf Steiner, let's remember that Hilma invited him to her studio to get his theosophical feedback, okay? And while what he had to say may have shocked her, she may have been grateful for that push to own her artistic agency that she mm. always had and not to rely on me Mediumship. Like we said, like there are a lot of reasons to not like Rudolf mm-hmm. Steiner, but I think they preferred Hilma's work before she took this more diagrammatic turn. It's more, it is, it looks more abstract. It's more comfortable to us as people who look at abstract work. Uh, Stephanie, since we're not going to the Art Slice Museum today, wah, wah, wah. Uh, let let's just let me just put <laughs> let me just put on some emotional music oh, okay. to take us out on a cliffhanger. Okay, <laughs> <clears throat> I'm gonna do my best impression of you. You ready? Please. Okay. Annie Besant. <laughs> <laughs> Annie Besant would eventually drive a wedge between the continental theosophical societies, and as a result, Rudolf Steiner, who had already gained an enormous following in Europe, would officially leave to form Anthroposophy in 1912. The construction of its world center, Gathanium, began in 1913 in Dornoch, Switzerland, where Hilma would travel to conduct spiritual research in their archives further refining both her message and craft to wrap up the paintings for the temple with two of her most stunning series, The Dove and Altarpieces, which is where we will pick back up next time on Art Slice. After a long break, we (laughs) need an extended break from Hilma. All right, we barely survived this. The next episode... The next 10 episodes will not be (laughs) Hilma. They will not be Hilma. No Hilma. Sorry, I love her, but no. So listeners, that's going to do it for us today. The featured music today was Startup Nation by Anonymous420 by way of Rose of Loyalty Freak Music. They make all these different albums under all these different monikers. Always amazing. Go pick up some of their albums. We will link them in the show notes. Thanks to longtime listener and patron St. Jupson for reading H.P. Blavatsky's quotes. Don't forget to let us know what you thought about the work. Share the show with a friend and join those fine folks like St. Jupson who make it possible for us to make Art Slice by supporting us on Patreon. We'll be back soon with a color episode to cleanse our palettes. And don't forget, your kid could absolutely not have painted this. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Farewell. Bye. So long. Hasta la vista. Peace. Adios. Hasta nunca. I'm just kidding. Don't say that. Hasta never. Oh my god. <laughs>